All right. Good morning, everyone. I'm Ann Walters Robertson, uh, Dean of the Division of the Humanities, and it is my distinct pleasure to welcome all of you to Humanities Day and to this year's keynote address. I trust today will be intellectually stimulating to, for you, offering many new discoveries and insights. Since 1980, we have gathered every third Saturday in October to celebrate the tremendous scope of our research and insights into the humanities. And every year, the devoted fans who choose to participate in Humanities Day have been increasing throughout the Chicago area. Indeed, over the past 38 years, this community has grown exponentially from the original core constituency that came from the university alone. The expansion of this community bodes well, I think, for the impact and strength of the humanities at the University of Chicago and in the world beyond our campus. As human beings, we are invested in how humanistic scholarship informs our outlook on the world every day. Whether you explore the virtual world of alternative reality gaming or learn about how two University of Chicago professors who understood the patterns of language and cracked the secret code of a German spy during World War I, the humanities connects us to the culture, knowledge, and meaning of what happens in the world around us. Today, as you learn about many topics, ranging from how to compose an opera to how the Muslim world viewed the Dreyfus Affair, I would ask you to consider how the humanities helps us both to understand and to practice knowledge. The quest for knowledge never ends, and the elements of that quest, how people process and record the human experience, form the broad foundation of the humanities. Intellectual curiosity leads to breakthroughs in knowledge, which in turn take us down many different roads. As the multiple presentations held today illustrate, Humanities Day explores the variety of paths that our scholars take. As part of this annual celebration of the humanities, every year we select one outstanding faculty member to deliver a keynote address based on his current research. This year, it is my honor to introduce Christopher Kennedy, the William H. Colvin Professor of Linguistics and Chair of the Department of Linguistics. Chris earned his bachelor's degree in 1989 from Dartmouth College. After gaining his master's at Yale in 1992, he headed west to the University of California at Santa Cruz, where he received his PhD in 1997. After serving for several years as linguistics professor at Northwestern, Chris came to U Chicago in 2003 as an associate professor, achieving the rank of professor in 2010. His specialties in linguistics include semantics and pragmatics. Now, semantics is the study of the human capacity to assign meanings to arbitrarily complex expressions of language, even ones we've never encountered before, Whereas pragmatics identifies how additional layers of meaning emerge in communicative interaction. Well, as you can gather, Chris studies meaning in language and words really do matter to him. Recently, he has been troubled to see terms such as fake news and alternative facts enter our common discourse. That's where his scholarship on truth comes into play. Chris is keenly interested in engaging the public in understanding the role that truth plays at the most fundamental level in making linguistic communication possible in the first place. And conversely, the role that properties of language play in influencing our perceptions of truth and falsity in our lives and our political beliefs. Like a democratic society, research in linguistics is a collaborative endeavor. Throughout his career, Chris has worked closely with philosophers and neuroscientists, as well as his U Chicago colleagues in multiple departments, schools, and divisions. In his scholarship, he delves into a wide range of topics, from quantifiers in English comparatives to Mandarin transitive comparatives and the grammar of measurement. 
Recently, Chris and his colleague, Ming Zheng, co-organized a workshop with faculty members in the Department of Philosophy. His keynote address, entitled simply, Truth, will explore the meaning of truth and the role it plays in thought and communication. He will also tell us why people should care about truth and the role it plays in a democratic society. Please join me in welcoming my always intellectually engaging colleague to the podium, ladies and gentlemen, Christopher Kennedy. <laughs> Thank you very much, Anne. Thank you all for coming out on this beautiful Saturday and spending a, an hour or more with the humanities at the University of Chicago. Um, to get things rolling this morning, get a kind of taste of where we're going to go, let's, let's go back to the summer. I think it was the summer. And, and when you tell me that, you know, he should testify because he's going to tell the truth and he shouldn't worry, well, that's so silly because it's somebody's version of the truth, not the truth. He didn't have a, a conversation about... Truth is about, truth. I, I don't mean to go like... I, no, I it isn't truth. Truth isn't truth. <laughs> Believe it or not, I'm going to tell you why that's not crazy, what he just said. <laughs> Part of the mission for today. But this would be useful to understand the bigger pictures, we're at, sorry, bigger things we're, we're, we're getting at by thinking about what on earth Rudy Giuliani could have meant in saying that. Um, so here's a roadmap for today. I'm going to begin by talking about the way that um, linguists understand truth as playing a role in enabling communication in the first place. Um, I'm going to look at some basic features of how languages come to have the capacity to convey information. I'm going to look at how humans use language to communicate with each other. Um, and we're going to focus in particular on a particular mode of communication, which is one that's sort of most relevant for um, the our own thinking about some of the um, complexities of things like alternative facts these days. Um, and then at the end, we're gonna, or in the, in the second part, we're gonna look at various deviations from truth and how they emerge. Some of them, it turns out, come just from the way that language is designed it's in, in, in the first place and, and are probably completely inevitable. Um, some of them are accidental and some of them are, are clearly intentional. At the end, we'll try to take some stock of what this all means. So to begin, let's think about the world a little bit. There's a very small part of the world over here on the slides. It's, there's a building in there, there's a person, there's a cat. Of course, the world contains lots and lots more things than that, but we can't fit them on a slide very easily. So we've just got a few things. Um, so the, the, the starting question for m people who do semantics like I do is, how is it that language um, can come to be a thing that has aboutness, a thing that we can use to actually carry information about the world? And the answer that we give, the starting point, has a lot to do with truth. So the thought is, when somebody, Anna here, says, Carlos is an American citizen, what I know, if I know the meanings of the words she said, is something about the world. Namely, that the individual Carlos, who is the person in this picture over here, is among the group of things that are the, comprise the set of American citizens. Now, whether he's actually an American citizen or not is in some sense beside the point, because all I'm talking about now is what I know when, the meaning, when, when I know the meaning of what she says. Right? That's a different thing from knowing what the facts are. Um, we're just talking about meaning at this point. We're not necessarily talking about reality. Um, this is a useful picture. The basic thought is the meaning of a sentence are the conditions that the world would, ha uh, that, that are in would need to be in place in order for the um, in the world in order for the sentence to be true. It gives us an immediate handle on how people can come to get disagree about things. So when, when Beatrice says Carlos is not an American citizen, the way that she characterizes the world looks like this. Carlos isn't in that group. Um, one thing we know about the world is that people can't be in two places at once. So these two descriptions are incompatible with each other. X, bad. That's why we hear Anna and Beatrice as, as disagreeing, as saying things that can't both be true at the same time. OK, this picture of meaning works pretty well for lots and lots of sentences. It works for things like, I'm an American citizen. It works for things like, that was the largest audience to ever witness an inauguration. Um, global warming is a hoax created by the Chinese. It even works for things like, this sentence is false. If you think about that sentence for a while and your head starts to hurt, um, 
when you ask yourself, is it true or is it false, the very fact that your head is hurting tells you that this is kind of on the right track. Um, but as the philosopher John Austin pointed out, there's a whole bunch of sentences for which this doesn't, didn't, just doesn't seem to be the right way of thinking about them, or at least about their meaning, or, and especially about what they do. So if I'm the right kind of person in the right kind of context, and I say to two people, I pronounce you man and wife, it just sort of seems wrong to ask whether what I said was true or false, right? The point is that I did something in saying what I said. Um, if I'm a, the right person, again, in the right context, and I say I sentence you to five years of hard labor, again, truth and falsity don't really seem relevant. Um, if I say I promise there'll be no new taxes, I apologize for breaking my promise, same thing, okay? So what Austin pointed out in looking at these kinds of sentences, which he called performatives, is that a crucial part of what we do with our words is not so much talk about truth and falsity and the way things are, but we, we perform other kinds of actions and other kinds of activities that have consequences for social relations, for commitments, for contracts, for any number of things. Um, but what he did that was even more important than that is to observe that that kind of thing is actually what we're doing all the time when we're using language to make communicative acts, in, in, in communicative acts, to perform communicative acts, what Austin and, and other people later call speech acts. Um, and that's gonna be important for us in thinking about truth and falsity right now. So let's step back a little bit and see what the nature, what, what Austin's talking about when he's talking about speech acts. Um, there's three essential parts. One part is the, in some ways, the least interesting part, but it, you know, that's not really the right way to think about it. There's all sorts of interesting things going on here. And that's the very produ production of the, of the utterance. So if I'm speaking, it's the production of a sentence, like I promise there'll be no new taxes. It could be an inscription on a piece of paper. It could be manual gestures if I'm speaking a sign language, but it, it is the, the actual activity. That activity is a thing that's a performance of some other thing, which is the, let's call it the meaningful element, what Austin calls the illocutionary act. So when I pronounce those words, I promise that there will be no new taxes in the right situation, I'm making a promise. Um, and the third part is the sort of downstream consequences of doing that. In the case of a promise, that's a commitment on my part, the speaker's part, to take responsibility to ensure some future state of affairs, and there might be other things going on too, involving the hearer, or addressees, and other people, potentially. So let's hone in even further on illocutionary acts, that part. Um, if we look at the case of promises, we see that they can be decomposed into two parts, one of which brings us back to truth. So here I'm following on the kind of insights of the philosopher John Searle, um, and many people after him. So in this case, I promise there'll be no new taxes. There's a part of this that has to do with truth. It's the there are no new taxes part. That part is true if it's false that there are new taxes and it's false if there are new taxes. That has the kind of meaning that we talked about at the beginning. There's, it's characterizing the world in some way. The other part of an illocutionary act of promising is what Searle calls the illocutionary point. And in this case, it's a commitment to the future truth of that blue content the content that there be no new taxes. But any illocutionary act has this, this, these two parts. There's some part that has to do with truth, and there's a part that has to do with how the, the truth-relevant part gets deployed. Any illocutionary act also comes with some conditions that need to be in place in order for these things to do what they're supposed to do. And that's the part that I really am most interested in here. These are called felicity conditions, and the easiest way to see how they, what they are and how they work is to violate them. So I'm gonna give you an example of a violation of a certain set of felicity conditions here. Some of you may be familiar with this particular example. I declare bankruptcy! Hey, I just wanted you to know that you can't just say the word bankruptcy and expect anything to happen. I didn't say it, I declared it. Still. <laughs> All right, so what's the problem? I mean, he, he I forget his name. Um, Steve. 
Like the actor, Steve Carell. Steve Carell's the actor, I mean the character. Michael, right? Um, so he recognizes that he's doing a particular kind of thing. He's not doing a saying, he's doing a declaration. That's a speech act. What he fails to recognize is the only way that declaring bankruptcy actually works is if you're in a certain context. You have to have certain legal structures in place, you have to have other people in the room and have filled out various forms, and et cetera, et cetera. Those are felicity conditions. In the absence of those, merely saying the words, I declare bankruptcy, doesn't result in you being in Chapter 11 protection. Um, so we can see these kinds of effects in other ways too. If I say to you, I promise that there will be no new taxes, but I have no intention to ensure that this is the case, I, it sounds, I sound irrational. Or I promise that there'll be no new taxes, but I have no ability to ensure that this is the case. Or I promise that there'll be no new taxes, though I know that this is impossible. I mean, in all of these cases, I've sort of failed in some important way in making a promise. And that's because the conditions that need to be in place for me to make a promise among the conditions are certain belief states and attitudes on my part, the speaker. I have to have the intention to follow through. I have to have the ability to follow through. And I have to believe it's possible to follow through. Um, these kinds of things are taken advantage of. So let's look at a different example. <clears throat> How, what, do you, what needs to be in, in place to make an apology? Well, it's weird to say, I apologize for saying those nasty things, though I'm glad I said them. <laughs> it's not an apology. But I don't care if it bothered you that I said those things. That's not an apology. And here's an important one, too. I apologize for saying those nasty things, though I don't believe you are actually offended. There's something kind of weird about that, right? Because uh, what should be in place for me to really make an apology is to accept that, as a matter of fact, some people were offended. And, and Typically, it's the person I'm directing my apology towards. That's why we have these so non-apologies of the form, I apologize if anyone was offended, right? These things happen all the time. This is an example from just a couple years ago. All right, so felicity conditions are normative constraints that need to be satisfied in order for a speech act to do the thing that it's supposed to do. They're the kind of rules that determine how different moves in the conversational game, the communicative game are played. And people who violate them over and over again usually get excluded from the game. They don't get to play anymore. And if you remember the moral of the boy who cried wolf story, that's just what this is about, right? If you keep on um, shouting out warnings without there being any danger, you lose your credibility as somebody who can perform the speech act of a warning. Okay, the kind of speech act that we're going to be interested in mostly today is what's known as the speech act of assertion. And this is what we do typically when we utter these simple sentences like Carlos is an American citizen, the ones that I talked about at the beginning, and characterize the meaning in terms of what they say about the world and what's true or false if the sentence is true. I mean, what the way the world is if the sentence is true. Austin's point is that whenever you say one of these, it's as though you said something like, I assert that Carlos is an American citizen. So you have performed a speech act. It's a speech act that, that we call assertion. And the questions that I want to go through now are two. What does one do when one makes an assertion? And what conditions need to be insat satisfied in order for an assertion to do the thing that it's supposed to do? Let me answer the first question first. What does one do when one makes an assertion? To answer that question, we need to, I need to tell you a little bit about how linguists and philosophers of language, people who study communication, conceptualize the, um, or model the, the way that we kind of keep track of information as we're talking, um, the context, if you like. Um, and the way that we usually think about it is in terms of two parts. One part is called the common ground, and that's the information that we, the participants in a discourse, so in this case, all of us in this room, because you all count as being part of the discourse, even though I'm the one doing all the talking. Um, the information that we jointly believe to be true. Okay, so all of us together share a set, we all have different beliefs, and they're probably all non-overlapping, but if you could take all the ones that are shared, that's our common ground. This is the information that we take to be settled. Um, the other part of the context is what's called the context set, and that's the information that's consistent with everything we take to be true. So that includes stuff that's unsettled, things about which we haven't decided whether we should believe them or not. So for example, if we all know, we all take it to be true that Amy, my colleague Amy Dahlstrom is an American citizen, she's on the top over here, and that I'm an American citizen, then it's part of the common ground 
that Amy is an American citizen and I'm an American citizen. So those pictures are representing the information that we all share. If we're asking a question, all of us in this room, about my colleague, Carlos Oregui, is he an American citizen? Then it's unsettled. We don't know whether he is or not. So the context set concludes two, sorry, includes two bits of information. One, he is an American citizen, and the other one, he's not. Those are both consistent with what we know. An assertion, a particular speech act, a performance of, of, a, of an utterance of Carlos is an American citizen with the intention to do this kind of speech act um, is a proposal to add the propositional content of that sentence to the common ground. So what it does when it works is it increases the body of information that's jointly believed and it reduces uncertainty about the world. So just to kind of show this in simple pictures, when Anna says Carlos is an American citizen, we take the top information over there, pop it into the common ground. The context set has to be consistent with the common ground so we no longer admit the possibility that he's not an American citizen. That's the dynamics of assertion. Now somebody might disagree with Anna, Beatrice proposes to add a different proposition to the common ground. He's not an American citizen. Now we have this conflict that we saw before. We can't all jointly believe both that he is an American citizen and that he's not. That's inconsistent. That's incoherent. So one move at that point would be to just say, okay, let's agree to disagree. We don't know what the facts are. Pop those things back out into the context set. It's still undecided whether he's an American citizen or not. Another thing that could happen, though, is you could have a split. If I believe Beatrice, I'm going to take on one set of beliefs. If you believe Anna, you're going to take on a different set of beliefs. All of a sudden, our shared beliefs had diverged into two different sets. You can call these uncommon grounds, if you like. This is a really simple example of what, over time, becomes what we now call polarization. OK. What needs to be in place for an assertion to do what I just showed you it does? to update beliefs. Um, three things, and I'm gonna show you, we're gonna go through, I'm gonna illustrate these conditions again by examples, both by showing places where they're obeyed and showing places where they're violated. So the two of the key conditions are that the speaker should believe what she's saying is true and the speaker should have some reason, some evidence for that belief. And here we're gonna call on, well, one friend, friend, um, the candidate Trump. So if you remember back before the 2016 election, Donald Trump was tweeting a bunch of stuff about voter fraud. And if we look at these tweets, you can see there are some assertions in there. Oh, there's large-scale voter fraud happening on and before Election Day. There's serious voter fraud in Virginia, New Hampshire, and California. That was after the election. Okay, those are assertions. Those are proposals to add the content of that, those assertions into the common ground. There's other kinds of speech acts in here, too. Um, why do Republican leaders deny what's going on? That's a question. So naive. That's an exc exclamation. If you look at the president's tweets, they sort of have, they have this structure a lot of the time. Assertion, question, exclamation. Sad. Um, we can, we'll talk about those later. Okay, so he's making an assertion here. He's making a couple of assertions. They have the same content. Here's our old friend. So this is a press, this is a press conference soon after the inauguration. It's an exchange between Sean Spicer and Maura Eliason, the NPR um, White House correspondent. Does the president believe that millions voted illegally in this election? And what evidence do you have of widespread voter fraud in this election, if that's the case? The president does believe that. He has stated that before. I think he stated his concerns of uh, voter fraud and, and people voting illegally during the campaign. And he continues to maintain that belief based on studies and evidence that people have presented to him. But exactly what evidence? I, I, well, I, Speaker I'll, Ryan today said there's no evidence. The National Association of Secretaries of State say that they don't agree with the president's assessment. What evidence do you have? I, 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 as I said, I think the president has believed that for a while based on studies and information he has. John Roberts. Um, in the waiting hours of All right. So just to re you know show you what, if you couldn't hear it, uh, Maura Eliasson says, does the president believe that millions voted illegally in this election? And what evidence do you have of widespread voter fraud? And Sean Spicer says, of course he says, right? The president does believe that based on studies and evidence people have presented to him. Imagine that instead he had said, no, the president doesn't actually believe that. <laughs> or yes, the president does believe that, but he has no evidence in support of that belief. Right? He, you know, the, the press secretary 
cannot say those things. Whether he believes them or not, who knows. Um, to say those things would be to acknowledge what Mara Eliasson is pushing at, which is essentially, have the felicity conditions for the president's assertions about voter fraud been met? Because she's skeptical. Um, and Spicer, to admit that they haven't been met is to say, is to acknowledge that the president is doing a kind of crying wolf type of behavior here. And he, he obviously can't get away with that. I mean, he, he would be fired. He was, well, he wasn't fired for that. So he wasn't strictly speaking fired, but. Um, so these just, these are, that's a kind of case that illustrates that in order to be seen as making an assertion, in order for an assertion to come off, you have to satisfy at least these two conditions. The speaker believes that what they're saying is true, and the speaker has evidence for that belief. Another way to see these kinds of things, so you might say, to, you might be thinking to yourself, oh, come on, people say things they don't believe all the time. Um, and, and you're right. And not only that, but we say things that we don't believe to be true precisely because we know that in saying that, we're gonna be caught, and we're gonna communicate somewhat something else in virtue of being caught, in virtue of clearly violating this rule. Here's an example of that. Morning. Morning. I have to say, I slept splendidly. <laughs> Granted, not long, but just deeply and well. I'm not surprised. A well-known folk cure for insomnia is to break into your neighbor's apartment and clean. <laughs> Sarcasm? You think? Granted, my methods may have been somewhat unorthodox, but I think the end result will be a measurable enhancement to Penny's quality of life. You know what? You convinced me. Maybe tonight we should sneak in and shampoo her carpet. You don't think that crosses a line? Yes. For God's sake, Sheldon, do I have to hold up a sarcasm sign every time I open my mouth? You have a sarcasm sign? <laughs> All right, so this isn't really sarcasm, it's actually irony, but that's the ostentatious violation of the felicity condition on assertion to say only what you believe to be true. So Sheldon's friend, I forget his name, is saying these things that are clearly false. But Sheldon, who has certain characteristics, doesn't get it, and that's sort of what the writers of this sequence are playing on, that's the nature of the joke. Um, Another kind of condition on assertion is non-redundancy. We shouldn't say things that everybody already knows to be true. And this is another case, that, another kind of condition that's often violated for a particular kind of communicative effect. Um, so some of you may remember this. This is an old commercial for Castrol motor oil. Dear beloved Uncle Dwight, he certainly had a lot of friends. The Pruitts drove all the way from Alaska. What? Alaska. Oh, Alaska. I counted license plates from 18 different states. Hey, Earl, what kind of motor oil do you use? Motor oil is motor oil. What? Motor oil is motor oil. Oh, yes, he is. Motor oil definitely is not motor oil. Four-cylinder cars work harder and need specially formulated Valvoline 4 guard. Don't drive your car to an early grave. Hey, all right, so, okay, so the situation, driving the car, the smoke is coming out, what kind of motor oil do you use? Oh, motor oil is motor oil. Okay, that's true. That could not fail to be true, right? It, it could not fail to be true that motor oil is motor oil. So in saying something that's a tautology like that, you provide no information. In presenting yourself as asserting something that cannot fail to be true, you add no information to the common ground. In doing that, you do something else. You communicate not the content of what you're saying, but some other thing like, ah, oh, in this case, doesn't matter about what kind of motor oil you're using, right? And then the rejoinder to that, of course, motor oil isn't motor oil, is to say the opposite. No, oh, in fact, there are different kinds of motor oil and some are better than others. Back to Mr. Giuliani. And when you tell me that, you know, he should testify because he's gonna tell the truth and he shouldn't worry, well, that's so silly because it's somebody's version of the truth, not the truth. He didn't have a, a conversation about... Truth is about, truth. I, I don't mean to go like... I, no, I it isn't truth. Truth isn't truth. The president... So Chuck Todd says, truth is truth. Obviously, right? What else could it be? But what's he really saying? He's Giuliani is trying to say, well, you know, there's this way of thinking about it, there's this way of thinking about it. Todd is saying, look, there's only one kind of truth. Right? In saying that thing, that, that tautological utterance, and Rudy Giuliani in saying, no, truth isn't truth, is trying to communicate, as a matter of fact, there's multiple varieties of truth. Right? So 
you know, we made lots of jokes about this when it came out, but in fact, this is quite a normal interaction that's, that's playing on these conventions that we have for how we make assertions. We'll come back to Giuliani later. Um, I'm not absolving him, I'm just saying that in, what he's doing here is not as kooky as you might have first thought. All right, so to sum up the chunk on assertion, here's what we should really care about. Assertion is, is a very powerful um, linguistic device that we have. When it does what it's supposed to do, it changes, it creates new shared beliefs. And shared beliefs are the basis for collective action, decision making, judgment, all sorts of important things. I like this quote from David Hume um, before he goes on to kind of talk about how we should distrust all sorts of claims. He points out that for most of our interactions, it's really crucial. Um, there's no species of reasoning more common, more useful, and even necessary to human life than that which is derived from the testimony of men. That's meaning beliefs that we form by asserting things to each other. Um, as we'll see later, among the shared beliefs that we build up with assertions are, and among the decisions that our assertions influence are decisions about whether to take the felicity conditions for future speech acts to be satisfied or not. That's going to be important. Okay, now again, just to summarize, belief and evidence conditions on assertion are these normative conventions. They underwrite assertion's power to do what it does, that is to change belief, and it regulates its application. Um, but we all know that things can go wrong. And I'm going to show you now two ways that things go wrong. Sometimes language gets in the way. We can't help but fail to satisfy these conditions because of the way that language is designed. And sometimes we get in the way. Uh, those would be, gonna maybe be the more interesting cases. But we've got to see these together because they interact. OK. When people ask me where I'm from, usually I'll say the following. I'm from Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Because I, I think, you know, people, well, I want to answer the question, and I want to answer it in a useful way. But in saying this, um, I'm actually saying something that's false. Why am I doing that? Um, well, if we, you can see Portsmouth there, right there down in the bottom corner on the seacoast next to Maine. If we zoom in on a Google map, I'm going to really need my glasses for this. We zoom in to about half the si less than half the size of the state. There's Portsmouth right there, but you still can't see where I'm from. It's not on the map. So we zoom in again. There's Portsmouth, but you can't see where I'm from. It's not on the map. Sad. Sad. <laughs> we zoom in again. There's Portsmouth. And finally, you can see where I'm from. It's called Newcastle right there. It's this little island right there. It's very small. So it's a, there's, there's the, that, that's one mile. So you see it's like less than a mile across or around a mile across. So why don't I say I'm from Newcastle, New Hampshire? Because nobody knows where it is. <laughs> nobody knows where it is. And usually it's, you know, I, the amount of work it would take to kind of go through an explanation to say exactly where it is is not really worth the effort of answering what the person wants to know when they ask me where are you from. Most people, many people at least know where Portsmouth is because you know candidates go through there every four years during the lead up to the presidential elections. You've got to go to New Hampshire, et cetera, et cetera. So that, that does the job just fine. Um, lots of what we say is like this. When I say I'm from Portsmouth, New Hampshire, I'm six foot three inches tall, I weigh 175 pounds. There are, well, not, maybe there are 300 people at the talk. <laughs> Mandel Hall was full, et cetera. In other situations, this might be useful. Um, <laughs> I wouldn't say those. I wouldn't say those today. Um, the first ones are fine, right? So am I 175 pounds? I don't know. I mean, I look at the scale. Sometimes it says that. Sometimes it says a little bit more. I probably literally cannot know whether I'm 175 pounds or not, because there's all these errors of our instruments, these errors of perception. We just can't get at the truth when we're talking about things like measures, typically. Um, but that's OK. Imagine if we had to. Imagine if we were really restricted to only say what was strictly speaking true and what we had really good evidence for. We couldn't even talk about these things at all. Right? So deviation from the truth is, is often quite all right. Um, in other cases, when you think about it, it's hard to know what, we, what it would actually take to make what we're saying true or false at all. Um, a bunch of our language is like this. I give you an example of one word, big. Um, big is something that a uranium atom can be and a planet can be. So there's a lot of flexibility in the meaning of what big tells us. And we know it means something like, okay, you're kind of on the high end of, a, of an ordering of things according to size, and maybe we restrict ourselves to certain subgroups of things when we do that. 
But what makes it true that you're on the high end of an ordering of things according to size? We really don't actually know strictly what divides the big things from the not big things. And you know, we know this, we can run experimental tests on people. If I tell you to choose the guitars that this sentence is true of and that it's false of, you're gonna say, ah, oh, these are big, these are not big, and then there are gonna be some in the middle where you just don't wanna answer my question. That's vagueness. I spent a lot of time thinking about this. Then there are other cases of language where the idea of truth, at least in a kind of absolute or objective sense, really looks like a non-starter. So when I say Tokyo is fun, or sea urchin is tasty, or Toshiro Mifune is the best, or Japanese is hard, it seems like I'm not really telling you some fact about the world. I'm telling you something about my own perspective or taste or take on things. Um, this is a picture of the great uh, Akira Kurosawa film, Rashomon, which runs through four or five, I can't remember now, different perspectives on the same event, and we never know exactly what the right perspective is. Um, and you might think, okay, well, this kind of language, big deal, who cares, we, you know, everyone has their own taste. But a ton of our language is like that, and in particular, a language involving really important words. So Lee is rich, therefore we should, he should pay more taxes. Um, that building is beautiful, therefore we should preserve it. The information is credible, therefore we should act on it. Abortion is wrong, therefore we should outlaw it. Okay, we make really important decisions using language that has a similar flavor of perspective dependence or subjectivity. Um, for which it just doesn't, at least it seems very difficult to imagine how you could say what it would mean to make, th make the world, uh, what it would mean to make these sentences true or false, what the world would have to be like. Okay, now there, I, I don't wanna say there's a, it's impossible. There's a bunch of really interesting work that tries to answer that question. I'm not gonna try to do it here, that's a whole nother talk. What I wanna point out now is just that all of this kind of language seem to undermine the very idea of objective truth in language and point instead to a much more relative, relativistic or perspective dependent picture. And this is an idea that goes way back, way back, at, you know, probably back further than the Greeks, but we have the Greek philosopher Protagoras, who's, you know, one of whose, you know, claims we remember now is the claim that man is the measure of all things, right? That knowledge and information is all dependent on the individual who's bringing that in. Um, Descartes, Descartes didn't, isn't really a subjectivist. Descartes said there was at least one thing we could be actually true of, and that was our own existence as a thinking thing. So his famous cogito. Where he goes from here though, is to try to address the truth or falsity of things out there in the world, but always through this internalist assessment of things. His main, one of his main contributions is to get us to think about the importance of um, the information that we bring in through our senses. Um, he tried to argue that we could actually make some sense of the outside world, but he had to kind of go to extreme measures to make that case, and not everybody believes his, 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 his thinks that his way of you know, getting him out of the corner he painted himself into works. Um, more recently, this kind of line that Descartes started got carried all through continental philosophy and into the contemporary day. We have Nietzsche saying there's only a perspective seeing, only a perspective knowing. And Rudy Giuliani, truth isn't truth, it's someone's version of the truth, right? It's essentially a family, a member of the same idea, same class of ideas. Okay, um, we're not gonna solve the problem of subjectivity today. All we're gonna do is observe that these things, loose talk, vagueness, subjectivity, they involve different kinds of uncertainty, a meaning, and uncertainty about truth. That without question is true. Um, and in some sense, they could not Language wouldn't work if these things weren't in place. Language is a system of discrete symbols. We are fallible but smart social primates who want to use that system to talk about a world that is not discrete, that's continuous. Um, we have limited access to it, but we've got to use this system that's sort of rigid in a flexible way. And arguably, all this stuff emerges in one way or another from that kind of attempt to solve that problem of linking these things together. We're actually pretty good at it. That's the amazing thing. We're pretty good at using this language, but there's a kind of trade-off between efficiency, accuracy, precision, commitment to particular truths um, that these things represent, and they now become the kinds of things that can be taken advantage of and exploited um, because they, for, for non-truth, because they provide a kind of wiggle room, a wiggle room to our assertory commitments. 
Okay, so let's now look at humans and what humans do and how humans use language and different varieties of failure to follow our felicity conditions of belief, evidence, um, and so forth. So we remember this case. This is Colin Powell's presentation to the UN in the lead up to the um, second Iraq war. And among the things that he said was this claim here. Saddam Hussein and his regime are concealing their efforts to produce more weapons of mass destruction. Now we now know that this was false. They weren't concealing any efforts because there weren't any efforts there at all, right? Um, Colin Powell has said, so was Powell lying? That's the question that we're asking. According to Powell himself, he was misinformed. So he believed what he was saying to be true. He believed that there was evidence based on what the intelligence agencies were feeding him. And his claim here was a mistake. It was a very consequential mistake, but it was a mistake. You know, we can choose to believe him or not at this point, but let's, let's say that potentially this is a, a mistake. It's not a lie. It's not a consequential mistake. President Barack Obama. If you like your doctor, you can keep your doctor. If you like your health care plan, you can keep your health care plan. This isn't an assertion, it's a promise. Um, did he, was he insincere in making this promise? Because it turned out, of course, we now know it wasn't strictly true. Some people couldn't keep their doctor. Some people couldn't keep their health care plan. The failure to follow through on this promise had big consequences um, in terms of you know, later uh, arguments about the, well, we, won't have to, we don't have to get into that. But as far as we know, he was sincere in making this promise. It just turned out that he couldn't, couldn't follow through. Okay, so these are failures and mistakes, but they're not obvious violations of the kinds of conditions for assertions or promising. We have to listen to this one. But I want to say one thing to the American people. I want you to listen to me. I'm going to say this again. I did not have sexual relations with that woman. Miss Lewinsky. I feel actually bad. I didn't realize the Clinton Global Initiative was going to be here later, but. <laughs> <laughs> I think we have to say that this was a lie, right? I mean, so did, did President Clinton believe what he was saying? Did have evidence? Well, he's making a first person statement. He's talking about himself. Presumably, he knows what happened in the past, things involving him. And he knows that he had sexual relations with Monica Lewinsky. So this is a lie. Um, now, he tried to say, well, it's loose talk. Uh, it depends on what sexual relations are all about. But the rest of us, I think, for the rest of us take this to have been a lie. So he, here's a lie. It's, just, it's a good example of what a lie is. You present yourself as satisfying the felicity conditions for assertion of some proposition. You intend for your audience to come to believe it, to add it to the common ground. But you believe it to be false. All right, what about this? The concept of global warming was created by and for the Chinese in order to make US manufacturing non-competitive, 2012. There's no public evidence that the Chinese created the concept of global warming. President Trump hasn't pre presented any evidence. He may have such evidence, he may not. He may believe that global warming, he may, he may actually believe that global warming is a, co a hoax. But all of this really seems to be beside the point. Really, it seems that his point in uttering this is to kind of get people to kind of err in one way and not err in another way, right? His goal is not about truth at all. This is bullshit. <laughs> so liars have beliefs about the truths of the propositions they assert. And the liar aims for the audience to come to adopt the opposite belief. This, they have a stance towards truth, and they have a goal. This is what dis distinguishes lying from bullshit. So this is a technical term due to the, the philosopher Henry Frankfurt. <laughs> to bullshit is to make an assertion in which you present yourself, again, as satisfying the felicity conditions for assertion. You intend for your audience to come to believe that that thing is true and add it to the common ground, but you don't have any stake in the game as far as truth goes. You don't care whether it's true or false. The aim of the bullshitter isn't really truth or anti-truth. It's not illocutionary, it's entirely perlocutionary. All you care about is what the results of your audience taking on this will, belief will be. And maybe in this particular case, it was to get people to kind of think along a particular line that would support some agendas later on. Or why, do, why do people, why does this work? Well, um, bullshitters, good bullshitters and good liars succeed by exploiting the principles that make communication work in the first place. 
right? They expect people to accommodate the belief and evidence conditions for assertion by saying things that they think are gonna align with what people already believe. Um, and they take advantage of the wiggle room of linguistic uncertainty. So here's a, here's a case study. This was from an article in the New York Times uh, a couple years ago, or not that long ago, but a year and a half ago. Um, it was a profile of this man here, Cameron Harris, who um, produced all these fake news pieces. And one that got a lot of hits, it was an on, for an online, online magazines, was this one that said that um, there are a bunch of boxes of fraudulent Clinton votes in an Ohio warehouse. Um, he had a whole bunch of other ones, too. Here's some of the titles of the things that he produced. Um, but the one that really caught on was this one about the, 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 the boxes of votes in the warehouse. And he, in the article, he's very clear. You know, my, my point in doing this was to get people to, to get a lot of clicks on my news feed so that I could then sell my, the, this particular news feed that he was setting up and pay for law school. This is what he said in the article of the Times. He wasn't really obviously like interested in necessarily supporting Trump or, support, or not supporting Clinton. He wanted to pay for law school by selling at a time at which his things had lots of clicks, which I guess is what one does. But how, why did he think that these things would work? This is the telling part. I had a theory when I sat down to write it. Given the severe distrust of the media among Trump supporters, anything that parroted Trump's talking points, people would click. Trump was saying, rigged election, rigged election. People were predisposed to believe Hillary Clinton could not win except by cheating. So he's taking advantage of the fact that there is this set of beliefs out there that form a common ground for a group of people who are then going to see his claims as being in line with the evidential and belief-based conditions on assertion and follow through and, and, and respond to his assertions with these clicks. So another kind of thing that we see, and especially in, in the president's tweets, are some of these, these, these cases that make use of, the un, of sort of loose talk. So if you remember um, a couple of years ago, I, th I guess it was the winter after he was elected, there was um, this discussion about whether you know, people had been spying on him in, in his offices in Trump Tower. There was this tweet here. Just found out that Obama had my wires tapped in Trump Tower just before the victory. Nothing found. This is McCarthyism. And he got some flack back for this because he says, well, no, they didn't tap his wires. That's illegal. It sounded like he was accusing the former president of illegal activity. Um, but later on, he said, well, nobody paid attention to the fact that I use quotation marks around the phrase wiretap which means that I, that doesn't, you shouldn't take me literally. I'm just meaning, you know, maybe they were kind of doing something that involved collecting information, a whole bunch of different kinds of stuff. Um, you know, Mexico will pay for the wall. Did he really mean that Mexico will pay for the wall or did he just mean in a kind of loose way that Mexico will contribute somehow? Right, this is loose talk. This is taking advantage of loose talk. So when somebody comes back to you and says, do you really believe what you said? Do you have evidence for this? You can kind of fall back and say, well, you, you took me to be saying something that I wasn't actually taking. I wasn't actually saying. All right, so wrapping up. Um, what these, we could look at many, many more examples of these, but we don't have all day. But these kind of point to the following conclusion. What the, everybody who makes an assertion, the truth teller, correct truth teller, the truth teller who's actually not telling truth because they're mistaken, like Colin Powell say, the liar, the bullshitter, all rely on is being seen to be in accord with the felicity conditions on assertion. If you're not seen to be in accord with these conditions, people ignore you. That's the boy who cried wolf. The way they do this is by directing their assertions towards an audience whose common ground is in alignment with the felicity conditions on the assertions. And so they one way of doing this, that's one, one important feature, and the other way is to take advantage of um, these different kinds of linguistic or epistemic uncertainty. Here's the important thing. When we accept an assertion, whether it be truth, whether it be a lie, whether it's bullshit, it updates the common ground in a way that brings that common ground even closer, in, into even closer alignment with assertions that have comparable felicity conditions. And it brings it farther away from alignment into another set of shared beliefs that have conflicting felicity conditions. So that enables more bullshit in one direction and resists it in the other direction. And this is what I was pointing out earlier when we were talking about polarization. Now, you know, it would be a totally reasonable response at this point to say, well, you know, 
hasn't this been going on forever? And, and I believe it must certainly have been going on forever. As long as people have been talking, we've always been lying and we've always been bullshitting. In fact, if any of you know the famous um, Turing test, it's a test for intelligence. Can a machine think? Well, what did Turing say? See if it can lie. That, that's effective. That, that, at the end of the day, is the nature of the Turing test. It may be that lying is one of our essential human capabilities. Um, and that's not so bad, right? I showed you that deviation from truth is inevitable in some cases. I don't really want to have to explain where Newcastle, New Hampshire is every time somebody asks me where I'm from. It's also valuable. I mean, imagine if we didn't have a world with uh, any linguistic fabrication. We wouldn't, none of my, all my colleagues in the literature departments would be, would be out of work. Um, and, and I at least wouldn't like that. Um, so, but here's the thing. What's special about now is that the sheer volume of speech acts being performed at all times, over and over, by quote unquote interlocutors who are at a greater and greater remove from each other, potentially across the globe through the internet, um, against a backdrop of ever diverging common grounds or uncommon grounds is tremendous. That, that's, in my view, the, the central difference between now and any time before now. Um, that's a thing that none of us understands, I don't think, at this point. Um, of course, the optimistic side is that people said the same thing, you know, probably when the printing press was invented, when writing was invented, which kind of had similar effects, and we solved those problems, so maybe we'll solve this one. But in the moment, we should be concerned. We should be concerned as much with the consequences of lies and bullshit as with their effects on these core sets of shared beliefs that make communication possible in the first place. And I'll leave you with two like, illustrations of each of these potential worries. The first we can call Cleopatra's remorse. Um, I was in London last week and I had the opportunity to see Antony and Cleopatra at the National Theater and we're going through, I'd never actually seen it before or read it, but there's this moment at the end where she thought, oh, that has to come into the truth lecture. Um, I don't know if you remember, many of you probably know the story, but at the end, towards the end of the play, Cleopatra's hiding herself in her tower and she's worried because Antony thinks that she's gone over to um, Caesar, gone over to his side. And she's like, oh, I know how to get him back. I'm going to tell him that I killed myself. So that's what happens. She knows it's a lie. But then later on, she starts thinking, oh, maybe that was a bad idea. And she sends one of her ladies over to find Antony and uh, Diomedes, who says what I've shown here. Um, she sent you word she was dead, but fearing since it how it might work has sent me to proclaim the truth, and I am come. I dread too late. Why does she say too late? Because Mark Antony's already killed himself, he's, or he stabbed himself, and he's lying on the, on the ground, bleeding to death. And Antony, sure enough, says, too late, good diamond. So the things, the beliefs that we take on affect our decisions, affect our actions. In this case, Antony's belief that Cleopatra had killed herself led him to attempt to, 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 to stab himself. Um, that was a unfortunate for Cleopatra. And the last case I'll leave you with is, a, is what I call Clifford's warning. It's from the mathematician and philosopher William Clifford. I was thinking about this, this particular case this morning as I was listening to NPR and our president's response to the Turkish versus Saudi reports about what happened um, at the Saudi embassy in, uh, um, uh, at the beginning of October with um, the um, Khashoggi, the, 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 the Saudi journalist. Clifford says, the danger to society is not merely that it should believe wrong things, though that's great enough, but that it should become credulous and lose the habit of testing things and inquiring into them, for then it must sink back into savagery. And so there, if we wonder whether it's okay to accept, we, you know, now with the, in the case of the Saudi, uh, the, the Saudi journalist, we have two lines to believe. One, he went into the embassy and he was murdered. Another one, he went into the embassy and got into a fist fight and uh, you know, things, things go wrong in fist fights and he ended up dying. Two different kinds of assertions, one of which could believe, be believed and one of which could be, not be believed. One of which you can get behind as say the President of the United States or the other one you could get behind as the President of the United States. And you know, it makes a difference as to whether we take on things that we jointly and in a shared effort believed to be true or not. It makes a difference into how we go on and reason and communicate uh, after that. That's the end. Uh, 
the, the murder of Khashoggi. Khashoggi. The only problem with that was, I agree with you about, you could look at it one way or the other, except that that team that came in of 18 people brought a, a saw to saw up his uh, body. There is a fact of the matter. So there is a, there is a fact in there oh, yeah. which differentiates between, well, you can believe one side or another. There Precisely, was that's, that's my point. We now have two narratives. We have two claims, right. they're incompatible. One is right. that he was murdered, but one is that he got in a fight with and was accidentally, I mean, the, the thought would be he was accidentally killed as part of the fight. With the 18 people right. in there. And uh, it's up to us to decide what we take to be the thing that has the good, what, what, we, what to add to the common ground. And that's influenced by, among other things, what people who might have some authority take on that. The President of the United States is one of those people. So if the President of the United States gets behind one narrative that the rest of us think is bogus, that leads to this kind of situation where we seem to be taking on things in the absence of careful and reasonable consideration of those things. Right? So why President of United States lying all the time about 3,000 times in two years or something like this? And second question, the, does its behavior making United States closer to some kind of fascist country where you supposed to lie all the time? Um, so the answer to the first question, obviously, I don't, I don't know. Um, Can the, question, the two questions: Why does the president of the United States lie all the time? <laughs> the second question is: In doing that, does that push the United States towards becoming a fascist country? Um, so the, I don't have the answer to the first question, but the part of the point of this presentation would be to get people to think about exactly, that, that in a sense, sense, that's the crucial question, right? What is the motivation for saying the thing, for any person, but in this case, the President of the United States, for saying the things that you're saying? Um, one thought would be that part of the motivation for saying things that are kind of blatantly untrue much of the time is to create a kind of situation where everybody else is uncertain about how to take other kinds of claims. Right? That's, that's to create a situation that's like this. We don't know what to believe. We don't know how to behave. We don't know how to make our decisions. I'm going to question voting results because I've been told over and over again by somebody that voting results might be fraudulent. Um, in doing that, that certainly sets the stage for any number of things, one of which could be the, the, the particularly negative outcome that you're talking about because you know, not, not only fascist countries, you could be, a, not be a, you, any kind of country that's not run democratically, right, which includes a number of different modes of government um, involve, let me rephrase that. A society that is run democratically is one that's run on joint decision making. Joint decision making, joint reasoning, argument, interaction, um, back and forth, the construction of a set of shared beliefs that all of us together take to be uh, developed using a similar kind of mode of assessment. This kind of stuff disrupts that, right? It disrupts that. So it's clearly anti-democratic. And then where it goes from there is maybe related to the answer to the first question. See it. Uh, certain research at uh, Temple University has shown that uh, certain parts of the brain kind of light up and, and during MRI studies when somebody is lying. And we all know that uh, lie detectors, traditional lie detectors are not reliable. So what do you think about that as a, as a measure of truth? Uh, <laughs> um, can I get you to spell that question out a little bit more? So are you asking me, do I think we should, um, Somebody should build a thing that's doing mini MRIs in our brain and we can attach it to certain people and it'll light up when they're lying? Or are you wondering whether I think that that's a sound methodology kind of generally? Well, how about this? Is, is there some way of really measuring truth? 
Measuring whether somebody is saying something actually true. Do you true? think it's possible at some point no. in the future that we could do that? No. I think, um, it, it, so there's, we need to separate out whether somebody believes what they're saying is true from whether what they're saying is actually true or false. So I, I, take, I got convinced by Descartes that the last is probably going to be impossible. Um, the former is the relevant thing here. It's the, the important thing for communication for interaction, for decision making, is what we believe to be true, and whether we believe it based on reasonable, some kind of reasonable set of criteria. And that's, these kinds of studies are presumably tying into that. When I say something, uh, evidently, if, if I say something that I know to be false, um, you know, it creates some kind of brain activity of some sort. Will we have some reliable measure to do that? that I don't know. You'd have to, that's, that's a question that's partly for our colleagues in psychology and neuroscience as it, as it is for people in linguistics. Um, my guess is that, you know, they'll always be really good liars. Um, but, but, you know, it, it's just, I, it, I don't want to be too facetious about that because actually when you think about it, we, uh, this is something else that Hume said. We want to speak truly in some deep sense, right? This whole game of communication works because we, language users, when communicating with each other, in the normal case, are saying things that we believe to the best of our knowledge to be true, and that we believe to the best of our knowledge are supported by some kind of reasonable evidence. If that weren't the case, we literally could not communicate at all. Imagine that. Imagine that nothing that anybody said could be taken to reliably indicate that which they believe or reliably be based in any kind of experiential or, or other kind of evidence. You would have no reason to pay attention to anybody for anything, even mundane things like how do you, you know, find the bathroom, the closest bathroom. So there is something deep about this move towards truth. And you know, that's probably wired in in some way at this point. Maybe that's what these kinds of things are getting at. Do you believe that uh, a skepticism, if it's an absolute skepticism, and a, f a fairly unqualified skepticism, uh, leads inevitably to total credulity? Total credulity? Um, can you, so when you say absolute skepticism, do you mean in this kind of epistemic sense, like I just really can't be sure of anything that my senses are telling me, that sort of skepticism, or something else? I mean, basically, uh, not the uh, philosophical skepticism, which is more uh, say, uh, nuanced and uh, uh, qualified, say, Cartesian skepticism. I mean, popular skepticism, where people simply uh, don't know what to believe, or they believe that they don't know what to believe, and adopt it as some kind of general principle. Uh, it seems to me, if that is the case, uh, they're really uh, in the situation that uh, Clifford is describing yeah. of total credulity. Yeah, the certainly, they, certainly it leads to a situation where you're going to have a problem making any kind of decisions, problems of action, because action and decision and judgment are based on taking positions, based on taking beliefs, even in the presence of uncertainty. So Clifford, I didn't include this slide. Um, oh, it's John Dewey's birthday today. Um, I don't have a Dewey slide, but another slide that I could have included was something from the other pragmatist philosopher, William James. And Clifford's ethics of belief should be paired with James's will to believe, which is an argument for why we should take on beliefs even in the presence of uncertainty. So an argument for resisting a kind of deep skepticism. And it's a very thoughtful argument about the kinds of conditions under which that makes sense. And that, of course, that is the way we lead our lives. We are not certain about most of the things that we do, about most of the, 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 the beliefs that we have. Um, if you are, you know, people, eventually don't want to talk to you anymore because you're, you're a dogmatist. Um, so you're right. We must be, in some sense, non-skeptical. Um, but at the same time, we don't want to believe everything we hear, clearly, right? Um, that's a, so I, I don't know. I, my, my sense, for what it's worth, is th that he's more of a bullshitter than a liar. Um, but I wouldn't want to, yeah, I'm not, 
I study language. I, don't, I mean, I study people too, but <laughs> more it's language. But the latter one, do I think it's worse? I do, I do believe, and here I'm influenced by, uh, let me go back to our bullshit definition, um, Harry Frankfurt's discussion of this. I mean, the thought here is that in, in you know, whereas the liar has an attitude towards truth and falsity and often has an interest in whether things, how things actually are that is relative to what the kind of information they're communicating. Um, you know, there's a kind of engagement with the facts and a, and a, and a responsibility for the facts that the liar takes on um, that the bullshitter doesn't take on. So the bullshitter is in a way abusing the conventions of communication I would, one could argue, more than the liar because they're undermining the idea that we should care about truth at all. Um, and, and again, care about whether we believe something to be true. So, you know, that, that at the end of the day is the, is the key thing. I mean, we hope that our beliefs reflect reality. They correspond to reality most of the time. Um, but the, this, is a, this is a real you know, giving up on that kind of convention. In that sense, I mean, this is what just, I'm telling you what Frankfurt says, and I, I agree with him on this point, yeah. Hello, um, I'm a proxy to the lady to the right of me, who lost her voice. Uh, do you think that the recent trend in postmodernism in political discourse is merely a bump in modernism, or something which will continue? And how, in your opinion, did this type of vagueness begin to dominate language used to current in current events, was there an evolution that was noticed by linguists? So the first question was just to make sure I, I got it, is that whether the current or I current- I can just repeat it. Uh, do you think that the recent trend is postmodernism in political discourse <laughs> is merely a bump in modernism or something which will continue? Postmodernism in political discourse. Um, where's, where are my colleagues here? <laughs> You're asking a, the real humanist question here. Um, I don't know if I would call the current trend in political discourse having anything to do with postmodernism, though one thought, this thought that the Giuliani thought, right? Truth isn't truth. It's only someone's version of the truth. You could kind of frame in that way. I didn't play the rest of the Giuliani quote. Actually, what he's really talking about is about who to believe. Uh, and about whether we should believe one person or other who's, who are saying conflicting things. It's about credibility rather than about very variability and a perspective on true, actual truth. Um, you know, there is this line out there, this line of subjectivity that's come out. That's what you might think of as the postmodern line. Um, you know, I don't know whether that will continue or not. I think that one of the kind of goals of talking about this st stuff from my perspective is to say, um, is to you know, acknowledge that there are parts of language that kind of look like this. They look like they have this very strong individual perspective dependence and they get deployed from doing this sort of thing. But that's just one part and there's this whole set of other parts, the kind of normal kind of communication that really involves taking positions on what we believe to be the facts. Um, and that already is doing a lot of the heavy lifting in creating the kinds of different narratives that we see and different sets of beliefs, polarization, and enabling further um, divergences along there. So in a way, that, that's the stuff that we should really be focusing on, how that works, a little less than this sort of subjective versus objective type of question. And the second thought was about vagueness. Was it sort of when did it come in? When did it get in language? Yeah, I don't know. I would be very surprised also if that hasn't always been there. I mean, just for the reasons I said before, you know, language is a symbolic system. You know, you know we in our brains have to store words. They're things, they, we have to pronounce them. They can't go on forever. They have to be these little chunks of repeatable, reusable material um, that we can then attach significance to. Um, but the world is out there, it's a mess. I mean, it's not a mess, it's just, it's a kind of complex space where things kind of come in grades and continua, and we perceive them in grades and continua, right? So there's this, just this inherent mismatch between having something that's a kind of fixed symbol and the stuff that it's supposed to link up to. So in my view, vagueness, loose talk, these kinds of things are very efficient solutions for that mapping problem. 
Um, and we are remarkably good at using them, but they introduce this level of uncertainty that we have to navigate, and sometimes that, that leads us to, it, it's a thing that can be taken advantage of, and that can be exploited for this kind of stuff. All right, the dean says it's time to, for me to say thank you, um, and enjoy the rest of humanity's day.